All right, good afternoon to all of you and welcome to today's webinar, Building Vaccine Confidence, Putting the Child Back into Patient-Centered Care, Understanding, Preventing, and Managing Needle-Related Pain and Fear. I am Rim Busnan, Project Manager at Families Canada. Families Canada is the National Association of Family Support Centers. Our members are community-level organizations who provide hubs of free services, programs, and resources to primarily low-income and disadvantaged families in communities across Canada. Through our 500-plus members, we impact the lives of approximately 500,000 families per year. For nearly 50 years, we have helped our members meet the evolving and complex needs of families by piloting, adapting, and scaling evidence-based programming, by developing and disseminating evidence-informed resources, and by providing professional development opportunities. In our work, we partner with private, public, nonprofit, and academic organizations to turn knowledge into practice. We recognize that a multi-sector approach is essential for addressing barriers and strengthening families. So before I hand things over to our presenter, Please allow me a few moments to provide some context to today's webinar and share why we think the topic is so important. It has been less than a year since the WHO downgraded the COVID-19 pandemic from an international health emergency to an ongoing health issue. And while we have now entered a period of business as usual, the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to have a lingering effect for the foreseeable future with vaccinations continuing to be as important as ever, especially as we enter the flu season. Evidence suggests that flu and other respiratory illnesses are expected to increase significantly in winter of 2024. And at the same time, the Canadian population is behind on routine vaccination. To mitigate against the risk of surge of illness and hospitalizations this winter, intensive targeted vaccine promotion is necessary starting as early as possible with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada and in partnership with Solutions for Kids in Pain, Families Canada is working to increase the capacity of the family support sector to support vaccine confidence among groups facing marginalized, mar marginalization through a series of webinars discussing the most pressing vaccine-related topics. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Megan McMurtry is an Associate Professor in Psychology at the University of Guelph, Director of the Pediatric Pain, Health and Communication Lab, and a Clinical and Health Psychologist with the Pediatric Chronic Pain Program at McMaster's Children's Hospital. Dr. McMurtry was the co-principal investigator on the National Help Eliminate Pain in Kids and Adults team which created two clinical practice guidelines for vaccination pain and needle fear management. Aspects from the pain management guideline were endorsed for vaccinations worldwide by the, uh, by the WHO. She is a member of the CAR-TM scientific team, which makes the pain management guideline actionable. Dr. McMurtry was the sole psychologist on the subcommittee for the WHO's Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, tasked with creating guidance on immunization, stress-related responses. So Dr. McMurtry, over to you. Thank you so much for the welcome. And I'd like to thank Families Canada and Skip um, for uh, the invitation to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna be um, talking about putting the child back in patient-centered care and understanding and preventing um, and managing needle-related pain and fear today. So uh, first, just a couple of slides about SKIP. Um, so Solutions for Kids in Pain is a national uh, knowledge mobilization network, which focuses on the problem that research evidence really takes too long um, to get into clinical practice. So SKIP um, really aims to help with that um, and improve uh, children's pain through mobilizing evidence-based solutions and it does this through coordination and collaboration. And this is really special, particularly in Canada, um, because we are um, a world-renowned kind of area for pediatric pain research. So the plan for today um, is to uh, really talk about um, 
three different things. Um, so first is what's the problem? What are the consequences of unmanaged pain um, and fear? I need to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm going to define some important concepts that really help us understand then how we help. Okay, so we know um, that needles are really commonly used in healthcare. They're used for preventative purposes, as we talked about for vaccines, right? Keeping us healthy, keeping our communities healthy. Needles are also used for diagnosis, for medicine delivery, right? Um, and kind of monitoring, right? So we might also use needles for um, venipuncture um, to get blood draws, for example. So the issue is though, um, that although some people may consider needles just kind of a little poke, that's not the case for everybody. We're gonna see that actually, uh, there are a number of people who are quite afraid of needles. There is some pain um, involved with them. And the really important thing is that, um, you know, needles can be traumatic. Um, and trauma is really in the eye of the beholder. So it's really about that subjective experience of the person who's experiencing needles um, that, that matters. And children tell us, uh, whether they're children in hospital, children in the community, they tell us that it's one of their top fears, actually, is, is getting a needle. And this is even children um, with chronic illnesses. So we know that some fear of needles is very common. So about two out of three children are fearful of needles, and actually about one out of every four adults is also fear of me fearful of needles. Okay. And so this is actually really important because when we don't manage the pain and fear during needle procedures, such as vaccinations, and vaccinations are the most common needle procedures given kind of worldwide, um, when we don't manage this pain and fear, um, there are both short and long-term consequences. The short-term consequences include increased procedure time, right? The procedure is going to take longer. There's increased risk of injury, increased use of restraint, which itself can be traumatic. Imagine being held down to quote unquote, just get through the needle. This can be very traumatic for individuals. And also there's increased distress right at that procedure time. There can be negative memories formed of that event. And those can actually help us explain some of what happens longer term. So in the long term, there's actually, if you haven't managed pain and fear well for previous medical procedures, including needles, then there's increased distress at future procedures. There's formation of significant fears and phobias related to needles, um, and actually potentially delay or avoidance related to needles or healthcare more generally. So we already heard about the importance of vaccines. And in fact, the World Health Organization declared vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats to global health in 2019. So vaccine hesitancy or this um, the, the idea that someone is delaying or avoiding vaccines, um, this is a very complex issue. And we know, though, that concerns related to fear of needles and pain do contribute to vaccine hesitancy. So let's get on the same page um, with respect to some of our terms here. Um, so first is fear. So fear is a proximal alarm reaction to a real or kind of imagined threat, okay? And when we experience fear, we tend to try to escape, okay? And that makes sense. Anxiety is often confused with fear, but it's more future-oriented apprehension. And what we're trying to do if we experience really high anxiety is avoid. So fear and anxiety exist on a spectrum from low to high. And really the adaptiveness of those emotions depends on the context. So imagine, you know, someone was giving a presentation for work and they had absolutely no anxiety um, related to the presentation. Well, then they may not prepare at all. Well, that wouldn't be good. But imagine then that person had extreme anxiety and just decided to avoid the whole thing. Also not good, right? So some sort of optimal level is present probably in the middle. Fear works the same way too. We need fear to keep us safe at times, right? So I sometimes like to go running on trails in the woods. Um, one day I stopped because I saw this beautiful owl sitting up in a tree and I went to take a photo of it. It didn't enjoy that and it swooped down at me and fear helped me duck and get out of the way um, so this owl didn't hit me, right? And I just have, all I have is a blurry photo of an owl kind of coming at me. 
So fear and anxiety are related um, to phobias. But what I want you to remember is that just because somebody has some level of fear of needles, it doesn't mean that they have a phobia. A phobia is a mental health diagnosis and it requires extreme fear and anxiety combined with avoidance behavior or impairment related to it, okay? And so we're thinking at the very high end of the spectrum. In terms of related to needles, we're thinking of a specific phobia called blood injection injury phobia, and that's seen in about three to four and a half um, percent of the population. But we need to worry about people even if they don't have a diagnosis of phobia, because guess what? Lots of people do not present to get that diagnosis. They're just avoiding, right? And people who have high levels of fear, about one in 10, that may still really um, impact their ability to undergo needle procedures. Lastly, we know that needles by injection, right, um, vaccines do have some level of pain. So I want to make sure that we're also on the same page when it comes to how we understand pain. So pain is um, includes both a sensory component and an emotional component. And importantly, just because we know the amount of tissue damage that someone has experienced does not mean that we actually know the amount of pain that they have. Pain is a subjective experience, and it's always informed by biological, psychological, and social um, factors. So it's a biopsychosocial um, informed experience, much like fear is as well. So um, the other note that I have up here is about verbal description um, as being only one way to express um, pain. And this is important because historically we have not done well in managing certain um, vulnerable groups and their pain. So infants, children, and individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So just because someone expresses their pain differently than what we might expect or is unable to tell us verbally doesn't mean that they are not experiencing pain and in need of help. So um, the last sort of concept I want to get across is uh, related to vasovagal syncope or fainting. And um, essentially uh, what happens here is that an individual experiences an initial increase in blood pressure and heart rate, and then that's followed by an overcompensatory drop in both of them, which leads to feelings of faintness or actually um, fainting or losing consciousness. So there are prodromal signs of fainting, um, like feeling dizzy, seeing spots, feeling sweaty, feeling nauseated, and so on. Um, and so those are important also to kind of be aware of. People with a high fear of needles um, are more at risk for having a fainting response. And people who have a fainting response may be more high risk for having a fear of needles, but it's not 100% overlap. So some people who faint are not afraid of needles and vice versa. Also, um, this basal vagal response um, is, uh, does tend to run in families. So, so there is a genetic component here as well. Okay, so in this context, I want to show you this diagram. Okay, so this is a needle, needle procedure related context. In the box on the left, and this is gonna bring together a lot of what we've talked about. In the box on the left, we see the patient, the clinician, and the caregiver of present. Um, when we think about somebody who's getting a needle, they it's not just about that specific needle or point in time. Oftentimes I'm talking to people and they say, well, we just wanna get this over with. We just wanna finish this and get this procedure done. But I think that's a mistake um, because especially for more routine procedures like vaccinations, just getting through a specific needle and doing anything possible to do that creates a challenge later on. So if we're not managing pain and fear, what we're doing is we're setting up that person to carry that negative experience with them. Whereas we wanna set up a positive experience. So what we know is that pain and fear do amplify or exacerbate each other. And so someone does carry their experience if we move rightward in the diagram to future procedures. And in fact, they may become an adult who has a child of their own that they then need to be a caregiver for in the needle context. So we're gonna talk about interventions that target each of these players, the patient, the clinician, the caregiver. 
We're also going to talk about interventions that target the interaction. Remember I said pain and fear, there's a site, there's a psycho, psychological, social factors that are going to target those interactions. And then we also need to be thinking about people who have really high fears of needles because they are going to benefit from a different kind of intervention first before they can benefit from the interventions at the time of the needle. So in summary, my first summary, um, needle related fear is common and it exists on a spectrum. We know that fear can make pain worse and vice versa. And that if we don't manage procedure related pain and fear, there's both short and long term consequences. So a lot of what I'm going to be um, talking about today um, comes to us from um, a very large scale knowledge synthesis that we conducted. Um, so led by Dr. Anna Tadio, the Help Eliminate Pain in Kids and Adults is a national team um, that did a huge sort of search of the literature to answer 50 clinical questions about how to improve vaccination related kind of experiences and reduce pain and fear related to vaccines. Um, my role in that was co-principal investigator, um, along with some other um, roles, and I led the aspects um, on needle fear. And so these are all published and, and available. And the team, some many, many members of the team is um, are seen in that picture down there. Okay, so what do we do to help, right? And this is this is really what we need to focus on today. So first, we kind of need to choose our own adventure, if you will, or understand where to start. As I kind of mentioned before. Um, People who have really high levels of needle fear are going to need a different type of intervention. It's called exposure-based therapy that has to happen long before needle procedures happen. And I'm going to talk about that sort of last in the talk, okay? But those who have, um, they need help with pain and kind of low to moderate levels of fear, they will benefit from strategies more around the time of the needle. And that's what I'm going to talk about next, okay? So in order to understand which pathway we follow, we need to do screening, right? So these are um, questions up here, and basically it's uh, a way to try to figure out which path they need to, to follow. So screening can be done by asking questions like these. Um, they will vary depending on whether you're asking the child directly if they can report and they're sort of sophisticated enough to do that, or if you're talking to the caregiver. Um, so really what we're looking for is how afraid are they in terms of the intensity of the fear? Is there avoidance present? And when they have to undergo a needle procedure, what has happened in the past and how, you know, have procedures had to be stopped? Has restraint been used? Okay. So if um, there's high fear present, or if there's even kind of medium amounts of fear that have avoidance with them um, or restraint has been used, they're going to benefit from that exposure-based therapy that I talked about. Otherwise, we're going to talk um, about what to do next. Um, we also need to screen for fainting, right? And this is because there's a particular strategy um, that we will use to manage fainting in the context of needles. And so the questions are really asking about um, prodromal signs um, of fainting, as well as whether they've actually um, lost consciousness. And again, fainting does tend to run in families. Um, and so that can be a helpful thing um, to know. So in terms of what we can do to help, if they have um, pain and kind of low to medium amounts of fear at the time of the needle, um, this is what we're going to imagine we have right now, and we're going to go into the strategies. So um, what we have here is um, different classes of management um, strategies that are ordered across the bottom of the slide. So these come from our 2015 clinical practice guideline, and this was the one that was endorsed, um, or must, much of it was endorsed by the World Health Organization. So there are five domains or five Ps of, of, uh, of recommendations. The first is procedural, and that's what the actual um, vaccinators are going to be doing. So I've grayed that out because I'm not talking about that today, given the audience. The others are physical, pharmacological, psychological, um, and then process strategies are how you get the people to do all the other ones. And so we're gonna go through each of these in more detail. So first are um, physical strategies, and they have to do with body positioning um, and activity. So breastfeeding for infants under the age of two um, is really helpful for reducing pain during vaccinations. If an infant is not breastfeeding, they can be given um, sugar water or sweet tasting solution, and they can use non-nutritive sucking, like on a pacifier, for example. Positioning is really helpful and important across, um, across ages. 
So for really young babies, neonates, they can do sort of kangaroo care or skin to skin contact, right? Um, for babies who can sit upright, we do suggest that they are held upright. Um, it being kind of on our backs um, for many of us is scary, right? If you imagine someone kind of looming over you with a needle being on your back. So being seated upright is something that we do um, suggest and is supported by the literature. So children can be um, seated either on their parents' lap or on their own, depending on kind of their own preferences and their ability to, to keep still. Um, also for children and adolescents, um, providing uh, a tactile stimulation with cold um, can be helpful. So what you see here is called the Buzzy. It's a commercially available device. Um, that is, it's a, it's available in Canada. Um, and basically it vibrates and it also has a cold pack on it. And so that can be helpful um, for pain as well. So next is another physical strategy. And this is one that I kind of um, spoke about very briefly when I mentioned screening for fainting. So this is muscle tension. So for people who have a vasovagal response, even if it's sort of more those prodromal symptoms, like feeling dizzy and seeing spots, they can be asked to do this. So they sit in a chair, um, they tense or squeeze their muscles in their legs and their stomach. They hold that tension um, for 10 to 15 seconds or until their face feels flushed. Um, and then they release the tension back to baseline. Um, and then they repeat that cycle over and over again. It's important that they don't fully relax um, because what we're trying to do here is keep blood pressure up, right? To avoid um, that faint. So in terms of pharmacological strategies, um, we have topical anesthetics that are really helpful um, in managing pain from vaccinations. So um, they work in all ages. There are some challenges in terms of they, they do cost money and they require planning because they take time to work and the length of time depends on the product. Um, topical anesthetics do not remove all sensations, so people may feel pressure or pushing, but it does, uh, it does help with pain. And for infants, again, we can use sweet tasting solutions, okay, as, as we've talked about before. I put an X over vapo coolants. For children and adolescents, it's actually not, vapor coolants have not been demonstrated to reduce pain in children. Um, and there's actually only very limited data that they could be helpful for adults. So we don't suggest these. It's not recommended in our clinical practice guideline. And in particular, we wouldn't want other strategies to be forgotten and for this strategy to be used. So moving on um, to psychological, the first is sort of thinking about preparing for the needle. So we may make assumptions as adults that the child understands why they're getting the needle, but they may not. So actually explaining why the needle um, is needed is important. For all of the things I'm going to talk about on the slide, the child's developmental stage and level, as well as their sort of temperament and their, their own preferences, what do they want to know about? All of those things are really important. We want to put the child at the center of this. For These are general guidance um, items, though. So we can ask um, the child, you know, what they would like to know about. Typically, children want to know about um, how long is the procedure going to take? You know, who's going to be there and what are they going to be doing? What about all the different medical equipment? What's going to be used, right? And then you can also talk about what they may feel, hear, smell, or see. Oftentimes, people ask questions about the feel um, piece. So you're going to see later, I say, don't say something's not going to hurt. Don't say a needle isn't going to hurt because that's not necessarily true and you've lost credibility, right? So instead, what you want to do is open up um, the possibility for individual um, kind of responses and experiences. So you may say some people feel say that it feels like a little pinch and then it's over. Other people don't feel much of anything at all. You can tell me what it was like for you afterwards. Right? Um, and so that's important because we're not lying. And the fact is that that actually there's a full spectrum of responses, right? And then the child is asked what theirs was afterwards. 
And then lastly, it's important to talk about and plan the strategies that they're going to be using to help. So what are other people going to be doing to help the child cope, as well as what can the child do to help themselves, right? So because I know from other research I'm not presenting today from my lab that children are very concerned that people are going to not help them when they experience pain. Okay, so we want to make sure that they know that there are strategies that are going to be in place. So what to say and do sort of more generally beyond preparation. So this is maybe more right immediately before, during and after the needle. I'll talk about in a moment. So we want to be calm. Everyone there, every player there, we want to be calm as much as possible. So parents sometimes need support too or caregivers. We want to be positive. We want to use neutral language. So saying things like, here we go, instead of here comes the bee sting, which believe it or not, sometimes is said. Um, providing information that the child needs or wants to know. Inviting the child as well as the caregiver to participate is important in child and family-centered care. And to give space to answer questions. So what we're doing is we're creating a safe space, both psychologically and physically, um, to acknowledge and support individual differences and preferences. And this really connects to what I was saying on the previous slide, right? In terms of, say, the pain um, experience that they will have. So um, we do want to consider the youth's preferences and thinking about what to say kind of right before and during the needle. But there are some general guidelines that we have um, in response to sort of decades of literature. So I mentioned before using neutral words to, to signal the procedure. That's if the child wants to know when the procedure is going to start. That could be a question asked, right? Um, do distract. Um, and take their attention away from the pain. And we're gonna talk about distraction more on the next slide. So one part that's often confusing for people is that we ask you to avoid repeated reassurance by saying, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry, you'll be fine, things like that. That's a topic for a whole other um, presentation, to be honest, um, and it is an area of interest for me. But suffice it to say, research um, is, suggests that it really isn't particularly helpful um, in this context. And then also I talked about avoiding suggesting it won't hurt, right? Be honest. So for distraction, there's many things that can be used and children can be, depending on how old they are um, and their developmental stage, they can be uh, incorporated into discussions about what do you you want to use to help you cope for a distractor, right? Do you want to watch a video? Do you want to play a video game? Listen to music? Read a book? Do you want to talk about something like that movie we're going to go see? Um, you can use guided imagery, right? Or like a mental vacation. Um, we have developed a video game through the card system, and I'm going to talk about the card system in a little bit. And this video game can actually be used right before and during a needle um, and is designed to do that. So distractors should be um, something that the child enjoys, um, appropriate developmentally, and actually interesting to them, right? Because if it's boring, it's not going to distract them. So um, research coming out of um, Melanie Knoll's lab really helps guide us around um, after the needle, what to say. Um, so first is sort of elaborating on any positive aspects of the experience that you can kind of um, think about and praise their, their bravery and find something that the child did well, right? So, you know, you were so brave facing your fear, great job taking those deep breaths. If your child is exaggerating at all, um, then catch, or if the child um, is exaggerating, I'll catch those exaggerations and remind them actually of what really happened. And avoid pain and fear related words. Um, I have a link here that if we have time afterwards, I can show you if people are interested. I think it can be very helpful to do almost like a mini interview if it went well with the child right afterwards. And so I have one with my son um, right after his first COVID vaccine. And it's um, basically you can ask them, you know, how did it go? What did it feel like? What did you do to help yourself cope? And what did I do to help you cope? Because guess what? Kids believe themselves um, even more than they might believe you for future procedures, right? So the power of being able to show them a video of saying like, this is what you said right after yours, right? And obviously this would be probably most helpful when it was a, when it was a good experience. So moving to the card framework, and that was mentioned a little bit in my bio. Um, and again, this is this um, the card framework is led um, by Anna Tadio. So 
the basically from the clinical practice guideline, we wanted to make all the different strategies more actionable. And that's what the card system does. So each of the letters um, stands for um, a different thing. So C is for comfort, A is for ask, R is for relax, and D is for distract. Um, and so it targets all players involved in vaccination and really translates all of our strategies into a system that where everyone can kind of play their cards to improve the vaccination experience. And this includes targeting things in the environment, making sure that the, the patient and the family are really engaged, right, and educated about what they can do, and that it's very patient-centered and that the child gets to pick their own coping strategies, right? So it's not about somebody else saying, no, you can do this or you can't do this to cope. The child um, and the caregiver are more in charge of that. And this creates a sense of empowerment and a degree of control um, over, over the experience. And CARD has been shown to reduce um, pain, fear, and fainting in the context of vaccinations. So I've given you on this slide um, a link to uh, the CARD system website. So for our last, and it's going to be a briefer section um, of the talk, I do want to focus on how do we help when a child has a very high fear of needles? Remember, I talked about the two branches at the beginning. What do we do? So for somebody who has high fear, um, we typically need a mental health professional, um, but I'm going to go over uh, kind of a quick um, overview of what exposure-based therapy is. Um, to try to give you a sense um, of what happens. So if the screening for fear indicates that uh, someone is very high full, highly fearful of needles, with or without avoidance, we want to take the approach of exposure-based therapy. This falls under the umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy, and it is considered um, a very effective and gold standard treatment for anxiety disorders, and in particular, specific phobias. And we recommended its use um, also for high levels of needle fear. So in exposure-based therapy, someone practices facing their fear in a gradual, controlled way over and over again. So on this slide, we can see a worry hill. Um, so there's fear is building up. Um, and then coming back down. So build up to an apex at the purple arrow and comes back down and time is on um, the x-axis. So what happens through exposure um, is that we are asking someone to face their fear and learn that fear goes up, but it also comes down. What often happens when we're fearful, very fearful of something, is we go up to the top and then we escape, right? I talked about how fear leads to escape. But when we do that, we're actually reinforcing the fear because it seems like the fear is never going to go down because we escaped before it could. So exposure um, is based therapy basically works on the principle that someone's catastrophic belief needs to be um, addressed. So a catastrophic belief is what they're really worried about is going to happen. Exposure allows them um, to be in their feared situation and learn that either their fear comes down, their catastrophic belief doesn't happen, or that if it does, they can survive it. Now, really importantly here, this is for fears that are out of proportion to the danger posed, right? So we wouldn't do this for things that were actually the fear is a very logical response and the person's really in danger, okay? So... I mentioned that pain and kind of low management, low fear management strategies don't help with these individuals initially. The fear has to come down. And here's why. If we, like pain's important, right? Um, but when we've talked to hundreds of people about what they're afraid of uh, with respect to needles, they are, yes, maybe for pain, but also lots of other things being in the waiting room, smelling the alcohol swab, right? And so the fact is that. It doesn't, their fear doesn't just get up to that apex when they experience pain. No, no, no. It happens way before that, right? And so if we don't get them to learn that they can, um, that their fear will come down, that they can gain confidence, all those things, then it's really not going to be very helpful, all those pain management strategies at the time of the needle. So exposure is all about them facing their fear and gaining confidence over time that they can manage. 
So how do we do this, right? So the first is that the person needs to generate a bunch of situations related to the needle um, that they're afraid of. They need to rate their fear um, for each of them, and then they need to order them kind of from low to high. This creates a hierarchy or a needle fear ladder, okay? Um, and then they practice working their way up the hierarchy. Um, and they may need to face each step or situation many, many times until their fear comes down, right? Um, and before they need to move on to the next one. It's really important that their fear hierarchy also includes everything that they're really worried about. So for example, if I'm really worried about seeing blood during a needle, but my fear hierarchy like this one doesn't really have me exposed to that or face that fear, it's not going to work right? So we definitely have to have the fear focus in here. So obviously, when it comes to working with children with this, they need a lot of support. Um, but actually, adults do too. So in my lab, we've created a huge sat like list of all the situations that people have told us that they're afraid of, right, to help kind of generate these things. So as they're completing their hierarchy or their fear ladder, um, and facing their fear, they're gaining more and more experience that, that their fear is going to come down. And once it comes down to sort of more manageable levels, then they can benefit from all the strategies we talked about before um, in terms of the five P's in the card system. Okay, so here's my sort of second um, and kind of last summary. So um, for in terms of what the second part of the presentation covered, um, I want to return to our needle fear context um, and understanding pain and fear over time. So consistent with our understanding of pain and fear as biopsychosocial um, experiences, the interventions that we discussed really target them in different ways, right? Um, so we talked about pharmacological strategies, psychological, physical, and procedural strategies. And they target, like I said, each of the players that are involved in that needle context. And so what we're hoping through that, right, is that we're creating a more positive experience so that actually for the future needles, it's not pain and fear that's increasing, it's actually more comfort and confidence are increasing. Okay? And we talked also about how when someone has high needle fear, we need to address it um, ahead of time. So I just want to end with um, two slides about, um, because I have a couple of concluding remarks about high needle fear. So treatment for high needle fear um, and high, like high levels of needle fear is typically delivered by a mental health professional um, and for good reason. Uh, but there's major barriers um, to people accessing that care. So cost and coverage of insurance availability of mental health professionals and the training kind of required for that, wait lists and stigma, to name but a few of the barriers. So um, ultimately, I really strongly believe we need to work um, towards better access. And this is something that my lab has been working hard on. And we're developing psychoeducational resources for different um, ages to help with high needle fear. So on the right hand side is an example of a poster for a study that we're recruiting for right now, which is um, we're going to have phase one and phase two, but it's all about a children's book that I wrote and, a, and an e-resource for parents of youth who are between five and eight years old to help them understand how to manage, yes, pain and fear at the time of the needle, but also what to do when there's high needle fear present. We've also developed um, a workshop, and this is for, um, so it's a longer workshop, and it's for uh, parents of youth with high needle fear. And so we've recorded it, and it's freely available on our website. Um, we just ask for people to fill out a brief survey to make sure that, you know, the workshop does what it's supposed to do, and we can evaluate it and improve it in the future. So those are just a couple of the things that we're doing um, to try to make um, treatment for high needle fear more accessible. And I want to end with a thank you today for you, um, to you for your time. And I also want to say thank you to my students, um, my collaborators uh, and mentors, as well as the funders for, for various um, projects. Um, while I explored sort of one area of research that my lab um, does. And here are some resources um, for you as well. And my understanding is that the slides will be shared, so you'll be able to kind of click on those as well. So thank you very much.